originally when we had the concept of trying to do some show to go along with the pizza party or something, uh, Denny or somebody came up with the idea of showing some antique decoys. And we were going to, it was going to be, I think, Phil, myself, and DJ Taylor. And originally I think we were going to start with, it was going to be my favorite five, but even as anybody's math here can say, there's more than, there's more than ten decoys on this table. But we're going to get a chance to see some very good Minnesota decoys. All the decoys here are from, from the state of Minnesota. Um, for those of you that don't me, I'm Doug, don't know me, I'm Doug Lodermeyer. I wrote the book on Minnesota duck calls, Minnesota uh, duck decoys. Um, I'm on the board of directors for the Minnesota Decoy Foundation and the Minnesota Decoy Collectors Association. I collect, obviously I collect decoys, and, and, but I, my primary focus has always been on uh, Minnesota game, game calls. I have probably over 700 Minnesota game calls. Decoys, I'm now down to probably 50 in my flock. And I've gone through every imaginable collecting cycle from factory birds to different types of birds to all birds to all states to all regions. And over many, many years of maturation, I finally got down to Minnesota calls and Minnesota decoys. Finally, I've shove that down to a yet a finer subset and I, will, I try to collect, and I will say try, try to collect only Minnesota decoys that are made, that carvers that made both game calls and decoys. And I try to match those up. So I have examples of their game calls that they made and their decoys. So that's why I'm down to about 50, 50 uh, birds in my collection or so. Um, I'm more interested in quality of the birds, the quantity of birds to have. Um, so that's kind of where, that's kind of how I've got to where I am. So I brought an example of a call by each of these makers too. This really actually does represent my final, or my favorite five. And the first four are really easy to pick. It's the fifth one that gets really hard because now you're, that means you're going to, there's many very deserving decoys I didn't bring. The reason this is five, even though it, if you're California math, it's worth why one would say, well, you would come up with a bigger number, is I, brought, I cheated by bringing pairs or groups from a rate break. But if I was forced to, I could show you the best one out of the three, out of these three, and the best of the two, the best of the two. So it really is one, two, three, four, five that we have here. So um, this pair was made by a family. And I know there's some people here that could tell you what style of bird these are. Anyone? Illinois. 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 Illinois river birds. So why is an Illinois river bird doing in Minnesota, right? Mm -hmm. It's three generations of carvers in this family. They're from Blue Earth, Minnesota. Their family name was Aggressors. Harry Grandpa Gresser came from Illinois. That's where the Illinois influence came from. This is his son. So that made these decoys, and then they had he had sons who also made decoys. They weren't as they weren't as, probably as skilled of artisans as the father and grandfather were, but they, the two sons also made decoys. Um, done the, done in a very much in the Illinois River fashion, painting the same as that you would typically see down there by uh, Purdue's or Graves or any of the great makers from Illinois. These are beautiful examples of, uh, of Minnesota birds that have, um, uh, have uh, migrated to Minnesota and carried on that carried on that influence. If you were to look at his the grandpa, his father's decoys, he made what I call a turtleback or a humpback version. And if you look at you have the book here in the library, and I know many of you have the books, but if you look at the Gresser family, you can look at the very distinctive style that his grandfather had much of a, a rounded back turtleback type style of it. His son came much more to the typical Illinois River style of decoy. But this is an exceptionally good pair of decoys. I feel very fortunate to own uh, the pair. There are, of course, all these are working birds. Uh, they've been hunted over and been used. And this is a great example of one of their uh, duck calls. Um, is is uh, uh, something they, they made other game calls as well, crow calls and such, and such. They had a sports shop down in Blue Earth. They were very well known throughout the region. 
Um, they had buddies that they ran with and hunted with. Uh, one of them was Art Finney, and if you were to, he represented the state of Minnesota many times down in Vendalia at the uh, Nationals. They were quite the, sh they were quite the sportsmen, the hunters, the shooters. Uh, if you look in Jimmy Robinson's books on the uh, on the Grand Nationals, you'll see some of the, some of his uh, buddies that uh, were there. So that's the Gresser family, Blue Earth. That's one of my very favorite uh, uh, pairs or decoys. If I was going to pick one, I'd pick the hen would be my choice, be just because of the paint on it is so is so exceptional. And feel free to take a look at it. Um, this is a really this became my this became my fifth bird. So this was the last one I picked, and I kept coming back to this one because it's such an interesting bird, and it's very light. It's hollow. Uh, it's a singular event. It was a rig, personal rig that he made to hunt over, and it's very much in a, in a uh, East Coast, like a New Jersey style of decoy. This would be very similar to a Blair or something that you might have seen from there. I don't know, you know his family's history. May be that it came, they came that way. Everyone that came to Minnesota came from the East Coast and moved west. As simple as that. So. Hmm. You can be sure there's some East Coast influence in every one of these birds as they come forth, as they come across. And even even Illinois was was west at one point, and then Minnesota later, and so on, so on to get out to California. This is a very interesting, beautiful bird. There's not very many of these exist. He also made some brooches that were done the same style and uh, uh, flying brooches, and you, it'll have the same spade-like tail on it. And you'll see it in the book if you. If, take a look at that. And he made some uh, coat uh, hooks, pegs, where they have the exact same head style on them. Uh, it's just a, just a very cool bird and a very unusual style of bird for, uh, for something you find in Minnesota. Even more unusual, uh, Francis Muhlenstein, he was from St. Paul, he was a, a conductor on, a, on the uh, streetcar, but he was also a machinist at a bed, a brass bed company. So you had machinists background and tooling. His duck call is much more, maybe more interesting than his decoy, except there's so few of these exist that this is a very rare and uh, interesting bird. He made what's known as the flappy bill duck call. Mm -hmm. And you got to imagine, he built this, so the, the whole inside of the assembly is brass that he, mm. that he machined. Uh, the, he, he, he fitted the aluminum Builds. He carved the cedar heads. He put in the earliest ones. He put glass eyes. Later ones, he put tack eyes in them. They were made of cedar. He painted all these, and I think he sold them for two dollars a piece. If you can imagine the work that went into that, to mm. think that these in the 1920s or 30s sold for two bucks, and the guy was making these. But this is an exceptional uh, example of one of these. If you handle this, I don't mind if you handle it, but be extremely careful this build because they're very fragile. It, it calls not very well. It wasn't a no, it, but it wasn't made to be a novelty. It was meant to. It was sold in all the magazines, sports of field, field and stream. You can find ads from that period on these. So that's the call that goes with that, which is a very, very desirable call in the call collecting community. As is that call. This one is kind of a ringer in a way. This. So if I was going to pick my favorite, the best bird out of here, this it would be this particular bird. Many of you probably, some, I would think a lot of you would know, this is Dick Chival, who was one of uh, Minnesota's, uh, I think, premier carvers. He's a very interesting cat. He's, a, he's, he's still with us. He's still carving. Uh, he's got to start a long time ago as a teenager with a wooden bird. He's been carving birds forever. As long as I've you know, as long as I've been alive and and, and that's on. He's uh, uh, if, if it's if it's standing still, he'll paint it. So he 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 paints saw blades. He does beautiful paddles that he paints with uh, wildlife scenes on. Flat art. He's won many competitions of of uh, duck stamps. He's painted. Uh, he's never won the federal duck stamp, but he's but he's been a, a, a he's been a contender in it before. He's. Uh, He's just a, he's an exceptional, exceptional uh, carver. This is the best, part of the best rig that he ever made. And if, that's not just my opinion. If you were to ask 
deck, he will tell you that this is the best bird he's ever carved, and this is part. Of the, this is the best rig he ever carved. He carved them for uh, Gary Moss, who's a, also a very nationally known, renowned artist from Minnesota. Won many, many stamp competitions. Again, not won the Federal Duck Stamp, but it's been right there, and by all accounts, should win it, or should have won it at some point. Uh, phenomenal, phenomenal uh, artist. But he painted, he built this rig for uh, for Gary Moss. They hunted these on the Mississippi. Uh, Gary, like every starving artist, eventually wound up selling the decoys because he needed the money. So that's why they're back out in, in, in a round. I found these two. I was able to buy these two as, together. And I found this bird separately. So that's three of the six. So I know where three of the six birds are. So <laughs> I'm looking for the other three eventually. I would love to put them together. Dick was uh, did not make a game call, but he co he collaborated with a guy named uh, uh, Eddie Anderson, who made uh, Eddie's duck call, and he painted. As I said, he painted anything that stood still. He painted some of the calls for him, and that was those were the top grade premium ones. So that's how he sneaks into my collection. I'm glad I can't sneak Richard into my collection because, like I said, I think he makes a it makes an outstanding decoy. So that's part, that's that rig, and what I really like about the rig, not only the beauty of these birds and the quality of these birds, and the fact that it's the history that goes along with them and who owned these decoys before me. And I'm just a caretaker, you know. Somebody, somebody else will own them. And lastly, the fifth bird. <laughs> I had a taker already. The uh, fifth bird, and I, would, I guess I would pick this bird. Again, the hand. These were made by a gentleman from Mankato, uh, and that was a family of uh, hunters uh, down in, in Mankato. Uh, uh, Tyson's was the family's name. Artisa made these. I, I like these birds, and he made some very different style birds. If you look in the book again, you'll see some other ones. I have ones that are more elaborate and have a lot more carving and a lot more uh, raised wings and things like that. But what I've always I guess what I've always liked about these birds is, as they're, again, they're, they're, they were hunted over, they were, they were meant to hunt, but they're extremely folky, and that's what really, that's what really appealed to me about them. The heads are too small for the bodies, they're, too, they're, they're, they're a little bit goofy, but, but they speak to me for whatever reason. I think they're just neat, neat cool looking little birds. He made this style of bird, this style of little birds that he made, he made Drake bluebills, he made Drake redheads, and then he used the same hens. He only made one style of hen, but it would work with either one of the birds. So that's a pair. I'm working, I don't have the redhead Drake, but I've got my a line on one, and I hope to add him to my collection. And then I'd have the, I'd have representative of the uh, Drake, the hen, and uh, the Drake bluebill and redhead. So that's the Teeson family, and there was a uh, a brother that also made decoys along with him, and uh, their and their father made decoys, and their grandfather made decoys. So that's again generations of decoy carvers. And this is an example of their call, and it's just a big old cedar call. And it's just you know it's very Minnesota, very Minnesota. It's very uh, it's very unique, and uh, uh, just another great example of, of, uh, of a Minnesota game call. So there's my there's there's five. <laughs> show off your holy. You didn't show there's my there's my fifth. And this one is not a carver at all. Right? He did a carver, a maker of uh, game calls. Thank you for my Oli Gunderson. So this is a this is Oli Gunderson. Um, and in making the book and researching the book and working on that, I I discovered Oli Gunderson. And I, under, I discovered him the way you know Christopher Columbus or whoever discovered the United States. The Indians already knew it was there. Everybody up in Ashby and around uh, Lake Christina, with any age, knew who Willie Gunderson was and knew about him. But the decoy community didn't know who he was, and they didn't know uh, 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 anything of, uh, about the carver. A few of these decoys had sold in auctions and they were represented as upper New York State birds because that's where they were found. Nobody knew what they were until I was able to put the name on and do the research and find them. This bird was made in the late 1800s 
but it was repainted in the 1950s. And so it's a mallard, but it's not really a mallard. It's a, uh, it's a canvas back that he repurposed to be a mallard. So after the, after the heyday and the great shooting of, on Lake Christina for canvas backs, and when that ended and it started turning into more puddle ducks up in that area, he needed some mallards to shoot some, to, to decoy his mallards. So he used some of his old uh, canvas backs and repurposed it them as, as uh, uh, mallards. Interesting thing about him too is he, if you look, his weights are old printer slugs that he bought him. Sometimes this this one uh, this one might be a laxative, <laughs> yeah, but he, so I think he had a sense of humor too because he had it with all the lead slugs that he had choice from him. The ones he picked were always interesting, so I, I, I assume he had a sense of humor. But they're beautiful birds. They became, they went to auction uh, at, shortly after I found them and identified them, and they became the second highest selling bird in Minnesota. The only uh, carver that sells for more is John Tax from Osakis, and I know you have some examples here that you can show. Holy Gunderson came up number two. A pair of his uh, high head pintails sold for in the neighborhood of $40,000. But I snuck him in because I got a special place in my heart because this, this is my person I find and my uh, my uh, contribution to the to the decoy community and especially the Minnesota's community. So I keep all. Yeah, those are beauties. Uh, Dave was supposed to be here, but didn't. So I ended up bringing a few from the south side of Minnesota. He was going to cover the south half of Minnesota. I was going to take the north half. <laughs> Um, so I brought a few south ones just to show them all there. But uh, going off with Doug's uh, talk on decoys and calls, a member of our club, Mark Meyer, I thought I'd bring some of his earliest decoys that probably most of you guys haven't seen. Uh, this is a pair of bluebills, and he didn't hunt with these, but uh, I found them on his stuffed into one of his shelves. His shop was kind of like Danny's shop. It was a disaster zone, and uh, he sold them to me, but uh, I don't know how many he made or anything of this style, but he didn't make a whole no, lot. Um, but this is how Marv started out carving. That's, uh, again, kind of an Illinois style, pretty small, pretty flat, and this is getting a little bit newer, but not a lot. Uh, Marv actually hunted with these a uh, couple of mallards. And you can see, I didn't bring any of his new stuff. Uh, a lot of you guys maybe have seen it, but uh, uh, a totally different paint style than what he uses now, and he's been using this his new style for quite a while. Um, I guess we wanted to talk about the Minnesota decoys because uh, it's basically, it's up to the person. They, they made the decoys to hunt with. Uh, they didn't make them to be perfect, as you can see. None of them are a perfect duck, but they've all got character, a lot of character to them. And every guy that makes one makes something a little bit different. And uh, it just can really, some of them can really be beautiful, like uh, Ole Gunderson. That rounding and shaping on those decoys, uh, it just tickles everybody's fancy pudding line. Um, this is a duck call that Marv made, and this is buffalo horn. Uh, he made a couple of them, Doug's got one, I bought one, and I don't know if he had any more or not, but uh, it was just so unique I had to pick that up. Uh, Jim was blowing on that, but uh, he said, it doesn't sound too good. <laughs> um, these are John Tacks that he was talking about. No. These aren't $40,000 decoys or anything like that. This one, some people say it's a Fred Allen, which is Illinois. I say it's a John Tax. Um, they are so similar, it's really hard to tell. Some people say they can tell. Um, and uh, Joe, what's Joe's name that rates the decoy magazine? Ten Alley. Ten, no, not Joe. Ten Alley. Oh, Joe Angers. 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 Joe Angers, who writes the decoy magazine. Um, he and actually Tanelli would guarantee that this is 
was a John Tax, and every decoy that they called Fred Allen was a John Tax also, <laughs> because they've never come across anything that shows that Fred Allen made a decoy like that in Illinois. Um, that's just something Joe did. And uh, this is a canvas John Tax, and Ed, uh, Ed Shuck brought one in maybe last meeting, was it? Um, this is the same same decoy, different different decoy, but the same thing. Um, this one might have a little more scratch painting on the back. Uh, it's got a really good stamp, ink stamp on the bottom, and this is the John Tax stamped weight that actually screwed to the front. You won't find too many of those. This was John Van Holzer's that I bought off of. And John Tax, I. I mentioned was a harness maker, so he, he made laminated geese which sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars at auction, uh, which is probably his signature bird, but you can see the, the leather work and the fact that he was a harness maker and he, again, was going to waste the scraps and he made these decoys, which he stuffed and then he also put an internal weighting system in them, so he could literally throw them out and on, they would self-write themselves. So it was pretty ingenious little uh, uh, use use of his, his trade and his skills and and uh, remnants of uh, uh, leather to fashion decoys. Scrap, canvas, anything he can use. He made all, most of his decoys are laminate, just scraps of wood glued together, all of them. Um, he used anything and everything. A lot like Denny. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, Denny's hasn't, haven't hit $100,000 yet, but they're coming. Um, Dave probably recognizes this decoy. I absolutely love this decoy, and it, it just shows ingenuity in Minnesota. This is styrofoam with uh, plastic medical tape or something, and it's supposed to be a gold eye. Uh, you come up and look at it, I think it's unbelievable. Dave found this in a dump. It was in a dumpster in Glenwood, uh, <laughs> Glenwood Minnesota. And, uh, you can tell what it is real easy, but it's made out of styrofoam and tape. It <laughs> uh, absolutely blows me away. And here's another Minnesota made canvas decoy. This is a bluebill. Look at that keel. Huh. I like these uh, funky old decoys like that. They, uh, they just kind of trip my trigger. And imagine how many ducks that they decoyed, probably. Yeah, yeah, just unbelievable. You'd like to hear the stories each decoy could talk about. But, uh, uh, these next four decoys, uh, these are in, in the book. Now, I can't tell you the story on each one. Doug maybe could, but each one is in the book. And uh, this is uh, Robert Mitch of the St. Paul. And uh, he made uh, two goose decoys. Uh, I do have one of them. And there's one other one. Paul England uh, decoy. Duck call maker has it. And uh, it's for sale, by the way. If anyone wants it. Um, this is uh, Gerald O'Brien in the book out of Aiken using square nail eyes. Just a chunk of cedar it looks like, rough. It's just, uh, again, it's all just ingenuity, what they had handy and what they could make them out of. Uh, these Minnesota south half of the state, these are Heron Lake decoys. And these are actually my favorite of any of them. And I just love Heron Lake style. And this is a reheaded Heron Lake um, was it Abraham? Abraham was it? A bell? With a bell body? It is a bell body. Yeah. It is a bell body, yeah. James Ward Bell commissioned a bunch of birds to be made for his hunting rig up in uh, uh, Canada after the shooting went, went to hell in Heron Lake. And after the end of the market hunting era, they moved their operations up into Canada. And he, he had decoys fashioned at General Mills, which he was the president of, 
and all around the head. Had the bodies made there and shoved up it so that the Canadians would have a head start on getting the decoys made because the Canadians were famously slow at <laughs> building, <laughs> building decoys for, to his specifications and his speed that he needed them. So he helped them out by getting the bodies made and it also got around some, uh, some provincial laws about uh, uh, selling decoys. Selling uh, decoys. Shipping them in had to be all they were just yeah. parts basically. Mm -hmm. uh, this is reheaded. This head was made by uh, Joe Tanelli, I've been told, which is the son of the uh, famous decoy collector and, and dealer Joe Tanelli, who's at our show as all the time. Uh, this is a Sante, and again, they eat like bulging backs on them, I guess, like that. And he was pretty famous for using. Replaceable heads. And these heads. And other people ended up using a tool, I guess, but uh, they screw on. And it's just with a uh, little screw and the, uh, the attachment. What did they use it for? I think uh, curtains type of thing. Brass insert? Is it brass, brass insert there? I don't know if it's brass. No, it looks like steel, I think. Just a screw on end screw. And this is Albert Olson, who uh, again hunted Heron Lake. <coughs> and a little bit different style than a lot of them. They had uh, high, Heron Lakes tended to have tall, tall heads on them. And his a little more uh, staunch, but he does have a, what they call the horse, horse neck, horse head, horse head style. Horse head style. And they were very famous, the, the, the Olsen were very famous market hunters down on Heron Lake and later after market hunting was banned, uh, very famous poachers from the Heron Lake area. <laughs> Continued their craft. A little bit of outlaws. <laughs> Certainly his brother was. But those are very desirable birds. Any Heron Lake birds are very desirable. Yeah, any Heron Lake, if yeah, you happen to see any, uh, try and grab them, they're cheap. Uh, these are a lot, there's a few no names here. This is not known. Uh, this was found in a hardware store up on uh, Cass Lake, when up that way. And it sat on the uh, hardware store shelf for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're just kind of guessing it's Indian made. No name on it, no anything. And these are actually uh, some new ones that I just picked up. These are from the same area up by Cass Lake. This guy is uh, Pete Larson, I guess. And uh, he made his own decoys, and he and his wife ran a little uh, resort right on the river. And uh, he took out duck hunters, and he took out fishermen. And that's all they did. He had a little duck shop, and they shop. The resort was called, uh, I'll forget that, I don't even know. He had an odd name shop, like the Wild Duck Inn or something. You ever heard of Pete Larson? No. Well, there they are. These are fairly new decoys. The guy just died and they were sold in his estate. Left the photograph. <coughs> um, but he made uh, Blue Bills, Buffleheads, and Mallards. But they're all pretty unique. Some are earlier. These are his newer style. He can show these guys. He shows the wings, little wing grooves, a little more tail. This is a golden eye, a buffalo head, and blue bills. And otherwise, even I myself love horse, and this you can just see the rasp finish on this kind of stuff. And this is Wallace Anderson on Litchfield. Uh, Doug's got a rasp. Um, actually, Shaggo's from Litchfield too, isn't he? Uh, Hutch. Hutch, yeah, yeah. This finish on that bird is absolutely beautiful in my eyes. I love that stuff. And, uh, the coarser the better for me. Maybe that's why I like these beautiful things like this. I don't know. But ingenuity and decoy making. Tape, styrofoam, anything and everything. And that's kind of the beauty of Minnesota decoys too is from the standpoint of if you go out on the east coast you're going to find that you're going to find it. You're going to find different uh, schools of carvers, the Madison Mitchell's school of carvers, and there's a bunch of guys that 
saw Madison Mitchell, said carved like Madison Mitchell. There's a bunch of people in Illinois that's, you know, carved in the Purdue style. And that's a whole school that you'll see a, prevalent in an area. If you go out to California, you're going to see that there's a school out there. What I love about Minnesota decoys is there's no school. Every <laughs> German, Finn, Swede figured that they could make a decoy better than the other guy, just as good, you know. So nobody nobody copied it, anybody. They all took personal pride in what they were doing and had their own idea and saw it out. And as you can see by this, this is a great array of different decoys, and none of them look the same. The closest thing that you can say to a school is maybe the hair and leg with the high horse hats. And there, and there was a reason for that, is they, they made them so that they would stand up tall on hair and leg so the campus backs would see them. That, that, that's, that's what necessitated that. But if you look at these decoys, they're all wildly different from one another. Everybody had their own idea of what made a good decoy. That's what made, and to me, a collection that's different is much more interesting than a collection that is the same. If you want different Minnesotas or state. Almost like the Jesse Ventura school. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Minnesota unique. <clears throat> For a late Boba gun. But if you want to take a look at them or handle them, that's fine. Like I said, just, you know, please just don't pick them up by the head. I know you guys know that. Uh, earlier you said that the Mallards were a uh, certain style of that vehicle that were the marks. Between which styles? Well, the mallards. What's the aggressors? The aggressors. The difference between the aggressors? Yeah. That the, the Illinois style. Illinois. What makes up an Illinois style? It's the shape and the way that they, the way that they, the construction and the way that they built them. The head there on that one looks like an Illinois. Particularly, it's in, particularly you'll see it in the body with this with this tail that comes out. It's just like a shelf. Back that it comes down to a point to the back on the top of it, usually hollow in construction, and then they're uh, pretty pretty uh, streamlined as far as far as the shape goes on them. But that that would be a school, and that that does come out that Illinois school, and it and it, and it does because of the, the grandfather's influence of coming from the Illinois River Valley. A lot of them have brown bottoms. Yes. Yep. Does that come from river hunting, Jim? You think? It, well, it, when they used to hunt the backwaters of the river, you don't have big high waves. Yeah, right. Yeah. And they actually wrote better in the current with that little bit of a yeah. ship, ship's shape to it. If you look at some of the Purdue, the, the pintails in particular, the front almost comes out like the knife. Right. Yeah, exactly. And they cut the water and they, 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 would ride, they would ride in the current real well. And that's, that's, that's part of that style. Here, of course, they adapted a little bit more to the waters that they were hunting, and you'll see a lot of guys, you know, I mean, when you're getting on shallow water, stuff like that, there's a flat bottom where the degrowth will skitter more, but it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't. Do those still have the acres or the keels on them? The These ones? No. People didn't build decoys down in Illinois like with these. They just had a well, you know, like, they didn't have those hang-down keels. They just put a strip of lead on the bottom. Right. Of them. And that's all those keels like that. They never made it. Yeah. yeah, and those ones, too, were just weighted like that. But that's one of the things that happens with collect, uh, collectible birds over the years. Like, this decoy is missing, you know, this had a keel just like these two did, but somebody, to, for display, took the keel off, and the keel got separated, which I hate to see that, but it, yeah, it happens fairly well. Excellent job, gentlemen. Thank you. Yes, thank you.